I think that this crisis is opening a lot of people's perceptive capacity to see that, hey, you know, when the infrastructure fails, there are ways that we can take matters into our own hands and not only that we can, but that we should and that it's better for everybody. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonserviummedia If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 16th episode of the show. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, you may have noticed that to this point, I've never had to repeat a guest. But today we break that trend. I regret having to do this episode because it's with a heavy heart that I find it necessary. Before the turn of the year in Wuhan, China, an epidemic broke out that took the world by its grips. They called it coronavirus, or COVID-19. Everywhere from China, to Iran, to Italy, to even the United States, the virus has taken thousands upon thousands of innocent lives. As global supply chains threaten to fail us, as ordinary people continue to lose their jobs, and with few signs of the coronavirus slowing down, it's difficult to not feel a bit anxious under the weight of a pandemic seemingly capable of tremendous destruction. What caused it? How can we stop it? To what extent are states responsible for this mess? And can anarchism bring anything useful to the discussion? The slogan of this podcast is Radical Voices in Precarious Times. It's possible that this episode captures the spirit of those words better than any other interview we've released. Joining me today is the first person to appear twice on the show. Here's my interview with Dr. Michael Lawfer. Dr. Michael Lawfer is the director of the Institute for Autonomous Medicine and chief spokesperson for the Fourth Thieves Vinegar Collective. He's an anarchist and activist who puts his money where his mouth is. Dr. Michael Lawfer, welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. Good morning from Singapore. Wow. All the way on the other side of the world. How are things over there? Uh, ironically, it's really the safest place in the world here. I would be very, very lucky, even though we sort of think of Southeast Asia as being the epicenter of the outbreak here. Singapore is rather singular in its ability to have surveillance and control over spread of pathogens. And so having that capacity and having learned a lot from the SARS outbreak and being absolutely unafraid to act, uh, we've done pretty well here. So I I feel pretty safe. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I can't say I feel safe where I'm at. But um, And where are you located geographically? I just moved from Austin to San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, I wouldn't feel safe there either. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe with this conversation, you'll be able to put my fears at ease. Well, I'm not sure I can do that, but maybe put them into context at least. Sure, sure. All right. Well, um, you know, I got to admit something to you, Michael. My normalcy bias was really clouded my judgment with this whole coronavirus thing when it started happening. And... Now I feel a bit foolish not taking it seriously. I don't know if it was the same way for you, but... Well, I think I was kind of on the opposite side of that, where I was in a state of heightened awareness, what you might call in a uh, less charitably viewed language as panic way before anybody else did. And everybody was saying, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. And I was saying, hey, the sky is falling and we all better brace for it. And people were like, come on. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, that to say, I often am a heightened state of 
awareness on things that are health related and pathogen based. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes we get lucky and my concern is a little over amplified, but in this case it was not. Yeah, it seems that way. You know, I think we, we are currently to this day about 30 cases confirmed in San Antonio, Texas alone. And some are projecting that that's going to be doubled every week. You got get, give it to me straight, Doc. How bad is this thing they're calling the COVID nineteen? I mean, it's it's pretty bad. The interesting fact is that it's very difficult to get a good handle on things in terms of prognosticating and trying to figure out where these curves are going to land and how accurate the data that we have is. And how accurate the data we have is, is this really very, very difficult open question because there are so many things that skew the information that we have into being either an overestimate or an underestimate. One of the biggest problems is that the incubation period is not entirely understood yet. And so there's this very large error bar. There's this lag between infection and when symptoms arise. And so it's very hard to sort of track spread well, even using that information because it's, it's so sloppy. A number of governments, including the U.S. and China, we have information that they are intentionally trying to deflate the numbers to make their governments look less culpable in their lack of action to try and contain or suppress things. So that also skews the data terribly. In a lot of places, also the capacity for testing is limited, which skews the data terribly. So Mm -hmm. there are a lot of different factors that make it really hard to have a quality estimate and to really know how long it's going to be, Mm -hmm. how much worse it gets before it's going to start getting better, how much we're going to overshoot in terms of capacity. And of course, this varies by region based on the structure of government in each place, which is makes things even messier and so on and so on. I mean, we're very lucky in Singapore because Singapore is a city state. It's fairly small geographically. We have a very high population density, which makes it more volatile in terms of spread of pathogens. But again, we don't have a lot of space to cover and we are fairly resource rich country. So again, I'm very, very lucky. How do you think this whole thing got started? Well, it's not very well understood either, Mm -hmm. but the part to which I can speak with some more certainty is that we were long overdue for this. It's been years and years that we've been in a state of waiting for something to drop and knowing exactly which it was going to be is, of course, impossible or how it was going to manifest is, of course, impossible. But viruses are these really amazing things and they're constantly present and they are constantly evolving so quickly. And it was only a matter of time before we were in a position that something that was able to grab onto human cells and had a fairly high virulence and had some unpleasant health side effects was going to just tear through the world. And and here we are. Um, I'm surprised that it took as long as it did. What makes you think that it was inevitable? Well, when you look at sort of the evolution of the structure of human society and the evolution of viri within humanity, when you've got high population density, a high rate of movement between populations geographically, it's going to happen. I mean, viruses, depending on whose theory you believe, but most people believe that viruses sort of predate cellular life. And they've been evolving and they've been around us and they are around us. And Many of them don't affect us, and oftentimes there are ones that are even helpful. However, the ones that are pathogenic, the ones that do have deleterious effects on human health, will always be with us, have always been with us. And it's just a numbers game, roughly speaking, of how long it would be before 
one of them bubbled to the surface and managed to grab a hold of a human and then evolved in such a way to be able to tear through the population and take a bunch of us out. Okay. Well, we covered it in our last in the last episode that I did with you, but just in case anyone is unfamiliar with Fourth Thieves Vinegar Collective, why don't you briefly tell folks who y'all are and what you're doing in response to the outbreak? Yeah, so we're an anarchist collective and we work to try to get medicines and medical technologies into the hands of people who don't have them for whatever reason. And doesn't really matter how. We use whatever tools we can get our hands on and whatever we're capable of using. So currently, the first thing that we put out a couple of weeks ago was an anarchist guide to surviving COVID-19. And it's a uh, little handbook for people who are unable or unwilling to interface with the medical infrastructure to how you can handle dealing with this pandemic at home mostly. There are a number of things that we sort of cover, how to handle basic health to make it less likely that you're going to catch it, how to care for somebody who might have it, and the things to watch out for so that if symptoms get severe enough that you need hospitalization, that you can recognize that before it's so dire that hospitalization isn't going to help. Right. I was wondering if you could go a little into what those preventative steps actually look like. Yeah, absolutely. So. There are a lot of things circulating like this on the internet. Most people talking about basic things like hand washing, sterilization of common touch point surfaces, wearing gloves when you go out, taking care of your general health, trying to eat well, stay hydrated, not do things that impact your health negatively or put an extra load on your body, try to drink less, smoke less, uh, get better sleep, all the sort of things that, you know, your mother always told you, but you never listened to. So yeah, so we go through a lot of those in the little booklet that we put out, which uh, is is on the Internet Archive, and I'll give you a link to that. We also have an, a radio drama version, so if you prefer listening to things rather than reading them, that's available as well. I thought the audio version was great. It was really fun to do. Uh, a friend of the collective offered to read for us a really, really great order. And um, we sort of styled it after the dramas, the radio dramas of old, sort of in the War of the Worlds style. And it was it was fun to do. And it's, yeah, it's fun to listen to. What's funny is I sent that to someone who used to be pretty regularly involved with non-Servium. I sent him the audio version, the, mm-hmm. the radio dramatization or whatever. And he's like, dude, that's the same exact song. Apparently, y'all use one of the same classical songs that we use for the, a non-Servium intro, which is funny coincidence oh that's great yeah (laughs) i love that yeah so yeah those are yeah those were classic of the era we we picked them very deliberately it was it was a fun it was a fun sub project to do yeah in terms of those preventative measures the thing that seems to be a little difficult and dangerous is that the information that's proliferating oftentimes has a tendency to get corrupted and then it continues to spread and then there's this sort of incomplete information that happens, right? Because if if we say, okay, good, you know, we should all be washing our hands rather vigilantly, that means something very different to say an auto mechanic than it does to a brain surgeon, right? When when you hear wash your hands from a surgeon, this is a very, very strict, very specific protocol in terms of how they do it, their hand motion, what they use to wash with, how long they do it, how they touch the handles on the sink, how they let the water drip, what they're doing under their nails, the pattern of washing versus somebody who's just trying to get grit off their hands so it doesn't look disgusting. These are very different things, even though we have this sort of limited language where we say, wash your hands, that means something different. And it's nice to see that there are a lot of things that are circulating where people are talking about hand washing technique being important to sort of focus on taking it seriously enough. The the best sort of tagline version that I've heard so far is, imagine you have something in your eye that you need to get out but you've just spent half an hour chopping jalapenos. <laughs> Wash your hands like you would then. <laughs> you know, I saw when you retweeted that, and I swear to God, I think about that every single time I wash my hands now. 
Well, great. I'm glad. You know, it's because it's, it's a very intuitive thing, right? Yeah. Like that that hits us in the gut. We understand what that means. It's a very Texas thing, too. Yeah, right. And it's very Texan. Yeah, it's a very Texan thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> You've been chopping jalapenos for an hour, and now you need to take your contact lenses out? Cool. We know what's going to happen if you don't wash your hands mm -hmm. really, really, really well. So anything that we can use to sort of contextualize things without being technical, right? It's like we don't, we don't all need to suddenly develop, you know, advanced degrees in virology to understand what's going on or to be able to keep ourselves safe. We need very simple, easy to use tools that will keep us safe in this sort of medium term so that we, we can keep ourselves safe and we can keep each other safe. And again, the difficult part is that there are a number of things that are in play from an epidemiological standpoint that are somewhat counterintuitive. When people say, oh, make sure that you, you know, try and limit your social contact with other people, oftentimes people means, oh, don't get sick from other people. Don't get other people sick. Watch out for people who have symptoms. Don't go near people if you have symptoms. But again, this lag between being infected and showing symptoms means that you could look and feel fine. And in fact, you could look and feel fine and never experience symptoms and also have the pathogen pass through your body. You may have a very strong immune system that fights it off before it comes to the surface, but that doesn't mean it's not in your system replicating it. It doesn't mean it's rubbing off on all the things that you, you know, get near and touch. Mm -hmm. So it's this sort of over vigilance that we have to practice and encourage other people to practice without sounding pedantic or reactionary or mm -hmm. sort of authoritarian in, oh, you need to do this. We need to work harder to help each other try and navigate this space to say, look, we're all in this together. We need to keep each other safe. And although the problem is complex and it's hard to parse, there are these basic things that we can do that will make it better for everybody if we just stick to it as best we can. Definitely. You told me the other day that you were planning on rolling out an effort to give advice to people interested in creating sanctuaries in low population areas for people to escape the city. What's that all about? So one collective that is loosely affiliated with Four Thieves, or I should say is a friend, they're a friend of Four Thieves, um, has a space somewhere in upstate New York. And they said, hey, we're trying to build sort of a sanctuary so that people can get out of the pressure cooker that is New York City. This was uh, maybe a week or two ago. And they said, do you have ideas? And, and, and yeah, there were a lot of things that we sort of went over to try to figure out what to do. Because at first blush, right, this sounds like a really great idea. Like, OK, cool. You're in a low population area. Maybe you have some land. Maybe you have a big house. And you want to bring some people out of the city keep it safer. And this is a great idea. It totally is. Now, there are two very specific things that you want to avoid. The obvious one is you don't want to end up in the Edgar Allan Poe story, Mask of the Red Death, and merely have a very small pressure cooker that's just far away from the big pressure cooker, and everybody that you were trying to keep safe is now sick. And the second thing that you want to steer clear of is having a fire festival problem, which is you invite a whole bunch of people up to your place, and then all of a sudden you realize you can't feed them, or you don't have a septic tank that can keep up, mm -hmm. or any number of other infrastructural things that are beyond capacity. Again, we are going to be trying to write up a, a handbook so that people who are tr doing this, because I now we have at least two or three other people who are trying to do analogous things in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. We are trying to set up a good, flexible system of protocols that people can follow. Good systems for quarantining. So you have a system where people show up and they have minimal contact with the other cells of the population until it's clear that they're not infected. And then you integrate them into a particular group and you have these three tiers of groups where you have – people who for depending on how you really calculate it you have you have people where they are not showing symptoms and have not had contact with at risk people you have people who are not showing symptoms but may have had contact and then you have people who are sick and then there's the sort of fourth category of people who were sick but have recovered and those are going to be extremely 
powerful tools in the in the days to come because people who have recovered from it in all likelihood in most cases have immunity there's a lot of uh, speculation debate over whether people can be reinfected and even if that is non-zero in its possibility, the probability is very low. And so if you are somebody who has tested positive for COVID and you have recovered, in all likelihood, you will not fall victim to it again, which makes you a very, very powerful ally to be able to serve people who are sick and not be at risk yourself. So that's the first thing is, is trying to segment people into small groups so that if there is an infection that it doesn't spread to the rest of the group doing sort of a tiered triage of risk so that the cellularization can happen and people can move in terms of moving resources between those cells. So you have the people who are safe moving food to the people who may be at risk and the people who are maybe at risk moving to the people who are sick and so on and having also the, the channel of people who have recovered who can move between all groups and then the rest is sort of basic infrastructural things in terms of how do you handle food, how do you handle water, how do you handle electricity, how do you handle heat. And of course, the, the good model for this is, of course, the the uh, the necroscope that Vinay Gupta put together years ago in terms of the, the six ways to die, where you can get too hot, you can get too cold, you can starve, you can die of thirst, you can have an accident, or you can get sick. And currently, getting sick is the big one that everybody's worried about. And depending on where you are in the world, getting too hot or too cold is still a risk. Accidents, well, you know, we try and create a safe environment in general. Um, and then we want to make sure that people are hydrated, of course, and have food, which is always a problem, unfortunately. But in terms of setting up a structure, if you have a lot of land and then you're suddenly putting up, you know, hexi yurts or tents or whatever – you want to make sure that you have enough food and water and sewage and all of those things to keep everybody safe and at a good temperature. Yeah, definitely. I'm really looking forward to the uh, write up. I think there's going to be some definitely some useful information there and hopefully some information that people can utilize to help keep themselves safe. That is the hope. Very interesting mutual aid information. Speaking of mutual aid, now that we're in crisis mode, it's becoming more obvious to people how important it is. However, it doesn't seem that our mutual aid infrastructure was ready for a pandemic quite like this. How many cheers should we give to the voluntary efforts folks have been making to help stop spread the virus? Well, I think everybody who's doing that sort of thing is a hero. And there are a number of levels of really inspiring humanity mm -hmm. that that I find really comforting. First of all, th the magic of mutual aid is that it doesn't really require infrastructure in the larger sense in a lot of cases. Oftentimes, it is merely a matter of, oh, I have something and you need it? Here. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that simplicity that I <laughs> I often am caught raving about in cases where it's very hard to point to examples that are timely and high impact that now are so visible. Everybody's seeing it because we just need it and it's just happening. And that's the other point that's so magical is that another sort of anarchist tenant, we, so many of us often talk about the magic of self-organization that in times of need, these things just happen and everybody's like, oh yeah, right, no, it's gonna be chaos and people will just look out for their own interests and kill each other. And, and we're seeing very much the opposite. The thing that so many of us anarchists talk about so endlessly is that the capacity for mutual aid and self-organization is is a natural state. It is something that human beings and society can fall into with very little effort. It's merely a matter of perspective. It's merely a matter of what is motivating things. It's a matter of perceived need. And now we see so many examples of just the, this magic bubbling to the surface where people are caring for each other. People are giving people the things that they have more of than they need. People are generating things that 
they have the capacity to generate and sharing them, not because they're motivated out of some twisted sense of self-interest or some idea of, of incentive, but just because it's the right thing to do. A really basic example of this that just warms my heart so much I can't even tell you is that I got a I got a note from my parents who are living in the Pacific Northwest that they had been helping their neighbors. Mm -hmm. My father got in touch with me and he said, hey, look, there's no hand sanitizer. And I said, oh, you know, no big deal. Try going to the hardware store and getting ethanol as just a, a paint solvent. He said, they're out too. And I said, okay, cool. Well, try looking for a place that sells racing fuel. They will have ethanol or methanol. Um, and he found it. They had a, you know, giant barrels of it or smaller five and 10 gallon tanks of it. And so he brought it home, had way more than he knew it to deal with. And they started taking these little bitty canning jars and filling them with both ethanol and aloe, three parts to one, and then just giving it to their neighbors. And it was just this beautiful thing. They sent me pictures. It was so cute. I was so proud. And it was it was not because I suggested it. They just were like, hey, we have more of this than we need. Let's try and keep as many people safe as we can. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing examples of that everywhere. And it's so it's so encouraging. William Gillis, uh, a very thoughtful anarchist writer at one point, said something interesting where he said there are basically two camps of anarchists ones who believe that rulership is superfluous and we don't need it. And there are people who believe that power corrupts and is so dangerous and nobody should be ever handed the keys. And these sort of mirror this idea of like people are inherently good or people are inherently bad. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I've often been dismissed a little bit as the sort of dreamer who thinks of things as being better than they are or dreaming of a better world. And okay, cool. Maybe I am. Uh, <laughs> but I think that there's sort of a hybrid case of those two where I fall, where I believe that inherently people at their core are good. I think that that is our default state. And I think that most people learn a structure of being that is predatory. And that becomes the default state. That's not the one at the core of most people's being, but it is the one that they learn. And so in between that, it's nice to see that oftentimes in cases of crisis, that that essential self that is loving and compassionate and caring and cares for the good of the group as much or more than the good of the self comes to the surface and comes to bear. And it's it's encouraging to see. And of course, it's unfortunate to see that it, it takes a crisis like this for it to happen. But I'd rather see it than not. And here we are. This was going to happen one way or another. And so to see it also have the added benefit of people recognizing that maybe we could all just be nice to each other for a change is, <laughs> is a really viable option. It's a really, really viable option. Totally. Yeah. I think you and I reach similar conclusions from very different philosophical paths. I agree. I, I see it like my freedom depends on other people's freedom. Therefore, it seems like a good idea that I care for them and we have this sort of reciprocity going on. Mm -hmm. But it, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what does it matter how we got there? Like we are trying to cooperate in this manner, you know, and we see it as a valuable thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I think that especially in radical spaces politically that there's it's not that there isn't a time and place for discussing theory and the roots of it and what's important and and why we believe what we believe, but as you suggest at the end of the day, if we disagree ideologically but can manage to come together and get some things done so that things are better for everybody, I uh, I call that a win. Definitely, definitely. Speaking of these loose networks that we're all involved with, how do you think that we can strengthen those networks' capability to respond to situations like this? In terms of strengthening capacity, I think that the points of failure are a lot more amorphous than we would tend to think when we would traditionally go through and do sort of a an analysis of pipeline and uh, analysis of resource management. The place where things, I think, break down in kind of an invisible way is 
the degradation of human to human connection. So if you think about your network, you know, and, and anybody who's listening, right? If, 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 you, if you just take a moment to think of all of the people that you know, you sort of have a couple of tiers of people. You have people that you speak with very, very regularly every few days. They're people with whom you're close. They're people with whom you share a lot. They're people for whom you do a lot, right? The list of things that you wouldn't do to take care of them is pretty short. And then you have sort of a second tier of people that you have sort of a not quite as intimate a relationship with and you're not in touch with quite as regularly. But, you know, if you needed something, you could sort of sheepishly ask like, hey, do you mind? Um, And, you know, it would probably be okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have sort of a third tier of people that you're in touch with fairly irregularly. Maybe you only talk to these people every few months. And they would be people you'd feel rather uncomfortable asking for any favor of any severity, probably. And what we're finding, I think, is that those connections are gaining a little more strength, a little more solidarity, that even if the frequency with which you communicate with people isn't going up too much, that people are checking in with each other more. People are connecting with people they don't as much. And I think that that particular practice is something from which we could all benefit. A good thing that I try to do very regularly is I just I just take a few hours uh, every so often and I go through every contact I have in every channel that I have. So looking at just like every single thing I look through, you know, I try and look through everybody I have on Twitter and everybody I have in my email and everybody I have on my signal chat and everybody in Telegram and WhatsApp and you know, all of the various places where you might have people listed and just go through and, and, and look at each one and say, mm, is that somebody I should maybe check in on, you know, so that somebody knows that they have you to reach out to if they needed something that they feel a little more comfortable saying, Hey, do you know somebody who might have this? Mm-hmm. And if we all do that a little bit more, then that exponential capacity for resources grows. Because if you're a little less afraid to ask somebody for help, and the person with whom you're in touch is a little less afraid to ask somebody else for help, then if you say, look, there's this weird thing that I need, does anybody know? And if you start asking around, the likelihood with which it will come back and you'll be able to get it is increased by a multiplicative factor, an exponential factor rather than an additive factor. And also, you add that same multiplicative capacity to everybody else so that when somebody asks somebody who asks you, then you also have this broader capacity to reach out and say, yeah, you know, I might know somebody or I might know somebody who knows. And and that's not something that we think about as much when we're saying like, okay, how do we make sure that we have better pipelines for moving materials? How do we make sure that we have better ways to move resources or, or cryptocurrency or, or, or other types of tradable securities and commodities? And how do we make sure that we have food pipelines and mm-hmm. wastewater? And, and all of those things are important. But at the end of the day, the only way that you get any of those things is by communicating with other human beings. And that capacity for communication, trying to broaden those channels, trying to make that communication more human, more facile, is important. And so taking the time to check in on people just with no agenda, just go through and say, like, who are some people that I haven't talked to in a while and just check in, see how they are. And I think that if we all did that a little bit more, that we'd all be a little better off. And I think that people are doing that too, again, based on the crisis, being like, oh, I haven't talked to so-and-so in so long, I should check in. I mean, unfortunate that it took this, but great that people are doing it. I love that emphasis on communication. One of my favorite quotes by by an anarchist is, communication only occurs between equals. Hmm. You know, so often bureaucracy and states and the corporate model hamper that ability to communicate with one another. And what you're promoting is sort of more of a peer-to-peer situation, which is clearly going to be useful in the coming days. Yeah. And it makes that sort of 
when you reach out to somebody without an agenda, that's the thing that can make things, again, more human, where that inequality comes to bear when things feel strange because somebody's asking you for something and suddenly you feel uncomfortable because it feels like an exchange or you're asking somebody for something and it's going to feel again like an exchange. And when we work preemptively to try to open channels to make the movement of mutual aid easier, when we connect with people again on that human level, Mm -hmm. then what it allows us to do is that then when there is a need for a resource to move from point A to point B, it doesn't move into that difficult space of feeling like, oh, is this an exchange? Is this a favor? Is there something that feels like it's going to be something that ends up in a ledger and instead can just be like, hey, we're all in this together. I need something. Do you have it or know somebody who has it? And then all of a sudden, everything is so much stronger because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm an individual anarchist, so I think there is a time and a place for exchange, but I also think there's a time and place for things to exist outside of that realm also. So, and it's interesting, it's always interesting to, to parse those things out, but without getting into the weeds on that too much <laughs> and, and, and sort of focusing on institutions that stop communication from happening, how do existing institutions who are hostile to mutual aid efforts actively repress mutual aid? Well, not to be too simplistic about it, but I think that it mostly occurs through policing and legislation and, you know, having a monopoly on violence or a monopoly on coercive force or a relative monopoly. I try not to vilify these powers that I see as operating infrastructure that I see as counterproductive or even evil, to use a rather hackneyed term, because I think that in most cases, the people who are utilizing these tactics and setting up these sorts of infrastructure believe in some sort of misguided way that they're doing what's right. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're rubbing their hands together trying to screw people over in every case. I think there are some cases of that. But for the most part, at the end of the day, ideologically, right, people fall into like one of two categories. Basically, people should be trusted to be able to make decisions for themselves or people are too dumb to know what's right for them and they need to be ruled. And the people who fall into the latter category will set up uh, systems of control in order to narrow pipelines of movements of resources in order to make sure that things are controlled and idea that that is what's going to create a stable society. And of course, you and I don't believe that at all. But when we look at what creates that, the magic that can grow out of working to circumvent those controls is really inspiring. Yes, of course. All right. Let's say for just a moment, something very, very basic. If we were talking about a very basic antiviral like Tamiflu, which is a very controversial thing Mm -hmm. uh, in the medical community to start with, so it might not be the greatest example, but let's just say for a moment, like access to that. It is prescription only. You can't just go and buy it off the shelf. All right. Now we have a flu outbreak that's happening alongside the coronavirus outbreak. And there's also been some evidence suggesting that Tamiflu could also be a supportive antiviral against COVID as well. But you can't just go and get it. So how do we get this into the hands of people? All of a sudden, again, when you're asking about these these systems of control, it's like, well, why can't we all just get it? Well, all right. It's the question of these sort of three things that disenfranchise people from access to medications. You have price, Mm -hmm. you have legality, and you have infrastructure. And here, I think we have sort of all three playing into view where there are plenty of people who can't afford to go to a doctor or shop around for a doctor who's willing to give to them, then go to the drugstore and then have it purchased. Second of all, because of that fact that it is prescription only, there is, again, that barrier that you can't make the decision for yourself whether you want to take it and just get it. 
again, if you're moving within legal channels. And then there's this question of infrastructure saying like, well, how would you even get it depending on where you are in first world countries or in high population density areas in those first world countries, then maybe that's not so much of a problem. But if you live in a rural area or if you are in a country that doesn't have a good shipping pipeline, there's absolutely no guarantee that it would even be on the shelf anywhere nearby and you'd have to go and get it. And looking at those systems of control and leaving aside for the moment whether those were well-intentioned or not, that immediately, all of those bottlenecks suddenly compound one another to decrease access. And now I think that there's a lot of rethinking that's happening from the people who create those bottlenecks because in their mind is trying to keep the environment that they've been trying to create safe, it would be better for them, even the most self-interested of scenarios, mm -hmm. to be able to get medicine to everybody. Because, you know, we like to flat the curve, as people say, and, you know, stamp this out as, mm -hmm. as easily as possible. How did our ideological predecessors respond to the Spanish flu? Oh, yeah. I'm not enough of a historian to really know about that. Mm -hmm. Though, looking at the sort of history of medicine, the fact that once there was a rudimentary understanding of virology, the idea of just trying to isolate people because of human to human contact spread, I think that that was, you know, the, the oldest, most robust technology for handling an outbreak that we've ever had. And it remains so that for all of the miracle cures, for all of the understanding of virology and all the antiviral technology that we've developed and a million other things in terms of sanitation and aseptics, like still the best thing, the most robust thing is to try and keep people away from each other so that things aren't spreading. So I think that that's the most instructive thing looking back historically. And for, for thieves as a, uh, an example, our, our namesake, of course, comes from the plague times where people were scared to go into neighborhoods where they knew that there was a, a high community load of pathogen. And, um, mm -hmm. and that was well understood even at the time. And ultimately, one of the things that allowed for a recovery from the bubonic plague was when there was an understanding of how to utilize certain antimicrobials, which was a little more advanced. But again, the, the bedrock strength of trying to contain a pandemic is just not being in contact with other humans as much as possible. So I know you've talked about this with other folks before, but we didn't cover it on our last episode, and it seems especially timely to bring it up now. I know that the name Four Thieves Vinegar Collective was inspired by some things that were happening during the plague times in Europe. Can you just give us some backstory on the name? So during the plague times in Europe, there was some entity or group that nobody could identify that was moving through plague-ridden areas thieving. And it wasn't understood who was doing this or how, and it seemed so counterintuitive because everybody was avoiding plague-ridden areas like the plague. <laughs> and right, and so eventually this group was caught, and it was a group of four brothers. And the magistrate said, okay, well, we know what you've been doing, and we're going to put you all to death. Or you can tell us how you can slip in and out of plague-ridden areas without getting sick. What would you like to do? And they said, oh, but hold on, uh, let's chat for a second. Uh, we can work together maybe. And as it turned out, their mother was uh, an herbalist who had made a decoction of herbal antimicrobials in a vinegar base. That was something that you could wash with and also take internally that offered a certain amount of protection. And because this information then became public, people started using it and a lot of people managed to live just through the spread of good information. And so that story, feeling like a spiritual ancestor, was how we 
decided to name the collective, this idea that if we can spread information and people can take control and manage their own health and live instead of die and have greater quality of life in the years that they do have, then that's an undertaking worth doing. Very cool. I want to move on to some questions that relate to our current crisis and how the state relates to it. So it should be clear that states aren't particularly good at handling pandemics such as this. But what role, if any, have states played in promoting this pandemic? The most obvious one to my mind is the thing that we touched on earlier, which is when states want to give an impression that their particular geographic or uh, political entity is not culpable and then spread disinformation regarding how things are developing. So I think both China and the U.S. are extraordinarily guilty of this, trying to say, oh, 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 this isn't our problem. We're handling this fine. The numbers are very low. This is something that's somebody else's fault that came from somewhere else. And let's be xenophobic and shitty about it. And when bad data comes out, especially underestimates of things, then what that does is that quells people's tendency and organization's tendency to Mm -hmm. prepare and respond to it proportionally. And I think that that was that I think that has really been a rather horrific result of both of these things. And it's one of the things that we saw happen in China. And it's one of the things that we're seeing happen right now in the US. So that's, that's a big one. Because of the structure of exponential growth, also, when things are cast in a light of like, oh, hey, it's not that big a deal. Look, the numbers currently are low, and sort of promoting a perspective that is quantitatively illiterate instead of thinking about how things are changing over time and looking at exponential growth, but merely saying like, oh, hey, we had this many cases this week, which means we'll probably have that many more next week. So everybody just chill out and continue to go to work and play the lottery and eat hamburgers and everything's going to be fine. I think that's another place where a lot of danger lies I think the current culture of anti-intellectualism that is prevalent in the United States fed that as well. And that certainly is something that is of which the current administration is extraordinarily guilty. And so that's a little more indirect in terms of their culpability. But I would place a tremendous amount of blame on that as a factor, because when you promote anti-intellectualism and you then push disinformation in the form of false conclusions based on flawed logic, then you're creating huge problems. Yeah. So those are those are two immediate ones that that come to mind that bother me greatly. Sure, sure. Yeah. Downplaying the severity of the crisis is something we saw. Underreporting the deaths even blocking access to testing in different ways. Anything that skews the data or makes accessibility of the data or quality of the data less, all of those things that you mentioned, yeah, are really, really severe factors and they compound. Again, this is the other thing. When you think about anything that has an exponential structure, Mm -hmm. when you introduce an error, that error then becomes larger by that same multiplicative factor in the next cycle. So smaller errors become bigger errors as time goes on. Yeah, totally. And I I even learned about like Trump banning foreign medical supplies. Oh, swell. (laughs) um, Or or, or like uh, like you're saying, these sort of indirect things like that happen systematically, such as like occupational licensing that we're seeing. We're seeing now that the state is sort of suspending temporarily in order for people to have a hope at getting access to, to a cure. Yeah. You know, or hampering people's ability to get access to test kits, you know. Just from a a cultural perspective, the sort of ingrained authoritarian thought structure that plagues so many people, most people don't have 
the sufficient feeling of individual empowerment and freedom that if an authority figure doesn't give them the thing that they need, they don't feel, they don't think of, they don't imagine that there's a way for them to get it themselves without interfacing with that infrastructure that has blocked them. And so that's a really endemic problem that's that's woven into the fabric of all of this. But again, as you suggested earlier, I think that this crisis is opening a lot of people's perceptive capacity to see that, hey, you know, when the infrastructure fails, there are ways that we can take matters into our own hands. And mm-hmm. not only that we can, but that we should and that it's better for everybody. Some might conclude that since the state played a role in getting us in this mess, they then have a responsibility to get us out of it. But the problem with that line of reasoning is that if the state's incompetency is is what got us here, then it seems that there's no real room for optimism as far as their ability to get us out of the situation. (laughs) So I just wanna ask you, like, do you have any concerns when it comes to top-down, large-scale course of measures such as travel bans or lockdowns or things like that? Concerns, I think, kind of understates it. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I don't hold a lot of hope, nor have I ever, from solutions to come top-down. I think historically we see that very, very rarely does much happen that way. Mm-hmm. Even when you think in times of non-crisis, in a medical context, Going to a hospital is a very dangerous thing. Being in a hospital, being in a hospital, a hospital is geographically speaking the most dangerous place in the United States. Um, This isn't true in every place, but you're more likely to die in a hospital than anywhere else. Now, for those who are perceptive of the easy ways to misconstrue statistics, that fact is has a lot of baggage. And that's true. However, the thing to realize is that it's not that a hospital per se is a bad place to go or that you shouldn't go. But where does that come from? Well, there are a lot of pathogens in the hospital. You're probably already ill if you're in a hospital. There are a lot of things. But really, the thing that's super dangerous about being in a hospital is that pathogenic load. There are so many things that are kicking around. And if you're already in a state where you're susceptible, you're more likely to pick something up. So when you think about going to a hospital, if you've ever gone to a hospital ever, either as a patient or with a patient, and you walked away alive, the people that you should thank for letting you live are the maintenance people. Word. The janitors, the people making the beds, the people cleaning the floors and the walls and the bed rails. Those are the people that are saving lives. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who have always been saving lives. And again, given this crisis, finally, those people are getting some of the recognition they deserve, even though not the um, the sort of support and compensation they deserve. Mm -hmm. So. To circle back to the original thing that prompted uh, prompt from your question in terms of the the culpability of the state and what the state could do or should do or might do in terms of trying to repair this colossal fuck up. To draw an analogy to a business, when a business fails completely what happens is, is they'll shut down, stop being an institution, and then they will distribute the resources that are left to uh, the, the, you know, employees and shareholders of the company. I think a great solution would be for the United States government to just dissolve entirely and for all of the resources to go to the citizens in equal measure. I think that'd be a nice solution. And I mean, while we're at it, I think that like every other nation in the world could do that too, and we'd all be better off. Here, here. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get any pushback from me on that one. I promise you. Cool. Well, um, yeah. Let's uh, let's write that up and and send a send a letter requesting or demanding. Let's demand it. <laughs> let's re- write a declaration to the czar, and we can um, go from there. <laughs> Wait, do we have a czar? It depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. <laughs> All right, so 
Another way the state has possibly held back solutions to solving this problem is through stifling innovations in medicine to help fix it. How does the state hold back advancements in medicine? Oh boy. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty nasty can of worms that's close to my heart. <laughs> yeah. So there's a there's a conundrum that you run up against in looking at these sorts of problems. And it's an ethical question and it's a scientific question that has two sort of perceptive lenses through which you can view it. And if you imagine these things from two different perspectives, the the two perspectives become both pretty clear and pretty obvious if you accept the precepts under which those ideas were birthed. So imagine for a moment you're Surgeon General of the United States. What you're going to try to do is apply a, for lack of a better word, a macro ethical lens. You are trying to do the least amount of harm to the greatest number of people and increase quality of life and length of life for as many people as you can with the resources that you have. And that, that makes sense. Through that lens, when you're looking at developing solutions for health problems, you are going to be fairly risk averse in your approach. What you want to do is you want a very measured methodology to make sure that anything that you're going to roll out, because you're going to be rolling it out over huge numbers of people and huge numbers of cases that you're playing this numbers game. It's not always going to work. There are plenty of things that are going to fail. You're looking at wanting to do the greatest amount of good to the greatest number of people in as many cases as possible. And so taking a very measured approach in that regard makes sense and is understandable. On the other side of the spectrum, if you are at home and somebody that you care about is ill, nothing else in the world matters, right? The only thing that you care about is like, that's somebody I love and I want them to get better. And from that perspective, you would be willing to try or do anything. And the controls that are in place from the other end of the spectrum saying, well, we don't know how effective that might be. We don't know what the risks might be. There hasn't been enough testing for this. Mm -hmm. Or even the one that just makes my blood boil is that things that seem to be effective, but there just wasn't enough market for, and so they weren't produced. All of these things sort of end up trickling down, and the person at the end of the line who's just trying to make things better for the person that they care about is having to deal with this and watch their loved ones suffer or die. And so, of course, as an individual, assuming that you aren't hampered by the rule of law too much, you have the freedom to try things that might be experimental for which you might have incomplete data. But at that same time, you're, you're taking a gamble because you don't know whether something you're trying is going to be effective. You don't know whether there are going to be off-target effects that might be bad. And, and I think that the current outbreak is a really great example of this because we're dealing with a virus and viruses are really hard to treat. We do have antiviral technologies. They are somewhat complicated in the way they work. They target very specifically and they're very heavy handed tools also. So when you have antivirals in your system, oftentimes it can cause all kinds of nasty off target effects. So this prompts the question, how can you utilize the best information that is out there on an individual basis to try to affect a specific singular case as effectively as possible? And the best model that's out there with which I am familiar is the one that's utilized by people who are researching rare forms of cancer and orphan diseases. And this is this system of real-time adaptive trials. So if you think about maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, looking at cancer, if you wanted to do a trial on a drug or some sort of treatment methodology, it wasn't that difficult because there were about 10 types of cancer that were out there. There were about 10 different types of therapy that were out there. And there were a lot of people with cancer. So basically, if you wanted a test group, you could grab a bunch of people 
as time has gone on and we recognize that basically every single type of cancer is unique and that there are so many new different types of technology to approach that problem that basically every single person you're going to treat is going to be a sample size of one. There are ways to do real-time feedback to sort of say, okay, well, let's look at the history, look at what we know that might be related. Let's look at the patient in terms of how their body works with all the data that we can get this particular pathogen or illness, as much information as we can get. And we'll have a short list of things to try. We'll put them in a particular order. And then we will monitor how the patient is doing very, very closely so that we can adapt as quickly as possible to drop the things that aren't working and double down on the things which are working. And I see as a vision for the future of medicine in general, and more specifically for individualized medicine for people who are working outside the medical infrastructure to use models like this to be able to heal people who need it and don't have the support of a larger medical infrastructure. Yes, totally. See, to me, this pandemic sort of proves the whole point of open source medicine and what Fourth Thieves Vinegar Collective is trying to do in the first place. Absolutely. How might a mature anarchist society handle pandemics such as this one? And do states have an advantage in preventing the spread of pandemics? Yeah, I think this is a really important question to ask from a, a lot of perspectives. And I think the slippery issue with which we have to deal is to differentiate what we talk about when we talk about an effective solution and what we talk about when we talk about a good solution. Oftentimes, again, because of the limits of our language, those two are conflated. And then the situation becomes very much confused because the discussion that's happening between two parties is disconnected. One person is talking about a good solution while the other person is talking about an effective solution and no progress occurs in the discussion. And I think that looking at Singapore is a really great example, right? Singapore is an extraordinarily authoritarian state. I think one could even characterize it fairly by saying totalitarian. Everything's under control. Everything is surveilled. There is a very, very, very strict legal system and punishments are extraordinarily harsh. Now, is this a good system? Well, I wouldn't say it's a good system, but is it an effective system for doing what they're trying to accomplish? Well, absolutely. When you look around Singapore and you look at certain social problems that they've tried to deal with, the way they've dealt with them, I wouldn't characterize as good, but I would certainly characterize as effective. There's very little problem in Singapore with drug abuse. And why is this? Well, it's because drug trafficking carries the death penalty here. Is that a good solution? No. Is it an effective solution? Well, yeah. And personal freedom? Forget it. There isn't any personal freedom here. And to Singapore's credit, they don't purport to give any personal freedoms. They're trying to keep things under control. And they do that to a fairly good degree. Uh, same sort of thing. In most places, a lot of places in Asia, if you present as female and you ride public transportation, you're very likely going to get groped. Uh, that happens much less often in Singapore. Well, why? Well, because if you are caught doing that, you are guilty of what's called outrage of modesty, which carries caning as a penalty along with jail time. Is that a good solution? Well, no. But is it an effective solution? Yes, there's far, far, far less groping on the subway in Singapore than there is in, say, you know, other parts of Asia. Um, so in, in a similar way, looking at those sorts of trade-offs, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of our chat, Singapore is one of the safest places on earth. Now, why is that? Well, there are a combination of factors. First of all, we're very small. The nation's very small. The nation's extremely wealthy. And again, there's no real legislative process. It just rules can be passed instantly. 
when I get up in the morning and I go out for coffee, when I go from one building to another, there are people in masks monitoring the entrances with infrared cameras and they know if I have a fever and they will stop me and send me home. Oh, not just send me home, but I will be detained and the Bureau of Health will tag me as a risk and I will be put under mandatory quarantine for 14 days. And if you're under, you know, stay at home orders in Singapore, they're not just hoping you'll do it. The cops come to your house randomly every day to check to make sure that you are staying home. And if you are not home, you go to prison. Um, again, are these good systems? Absolutely not. But they are very effective systems. So I think these things are important to differentiate. So looking at Singapore as a really extreme example of an effective system that's very authoritarian, looking at the other end of the spectrum to say, well, if we had zero governance and we had an enlightened anarchist society, what would the good outcomes be? What would, what would we be hoping for? Yeah. How do we bridge the effective and the good? Right, right. The thing that, that has the capacity for bridging is when we promote a society of thoughtfulness and mutual aid in terms of developing analytical tools. So the dangerous thing that happens in situations like this, where you're trying to proliferate practices of uh, hygiene and social distancing and, and uh, disinfection and sepsis and all these things, is that there's this sort of de-skilling cyclic gap that happens where people will tend to want to make things more accessible. And in a well-intentioned attempt to make things more accessible, they will simplify or more often oversimplify things and say, here's a rule to follow that if you do, it will give a good outcome. The problem with that is that when you give a rule, there's this sterility to it, right? You can follow the rule, but following a rule is only good if A, you remember to follow it, B, you follow it every time, and C, you don't end up in any contexts where that rule's applicability might be in a gray area or confused or maybe not as clear cut. Now, to make things more flexible, instead, to give a conceptual basis for a practice makes more sense. In sort of my dreaming of a better world, when I think about these sorts of things, what would happen is we would all share points of understanding about the conceptual underpinnings of the practices that we'd like to spread. When we talk about things like hand washing, when we talk about using alcohol to wipe things down, when we talk, th those, those ideas, I mean, hand washing is a practice, right? Using alcohol to wipe things down, using hand sanitizer, okay, cool. But like, what is that actually doing? And again, I don't think it's necessary for us all to sit down and spend 30 hours doing a crash course in virology and talking about denaturing the protein structures that hold virus containers or what does that. But there's an intermediate place where we can say, look, let's take 20 minutes to talk about why we're doing what we're doing so that when people take actions to keep themselves and the community locally and the community at large safe, they're not doing it because they have a sense of obligation or doing it because they have something that they're following by rote, but they're making a personal decision to do something that's reasoned individually. And when you have people empowered with an idea of this is what this practice is geared to try to accomplish, then I think that we all come together very, very quickly to do what's best for all of us because we understand why we're doing it. When, when I see people uh, online who are so upset seeing people ignore the sort of basic rules that have been laid out to keep us all safe, the thing that I think that the people who are upset often miss is that these people aren't dismissing these practices, people who are going out to bars or going out to 
St. Patrick's Day or going out to party for spring break, like those people who say, oh, you know, if I get sick, I get sick. You know, it's not going to keep me from partying. Those people are really the victims in my mind, not so much because they're likely to suffer. They're likely to not. They're likely to be vectors for other people suffering, which, of course, is why everybody's upset and rightly so. However, I see those people as victims because nobody took the time or had the capacity or the channel to communicate to them, listen, here's the reason why this is important. People were given a rule. And of course, it's pretty human, I think, when somebody says, hey, do this to say, oh, really? <laughs> it's it's a very natural thing. I think a human thing to be anti-authoritarian. And when somebody gives you a rule to say, well, no, I'll do whatever I want to do. And the difference is, is that if we can get people to have a conceptual understanding of what's going on on a genuinely conceptual level, then when somebody says, don't tell me what to do, I'm going to do whatever I think is right to do, that when they do do that, then they're going to make decisions which are best for them and best for everybody else. And I think that that's not that great of a stretch. We just have to restructure our thinking and looking at all the grand, grand changes that have been happening during this pandemic. I don't think it's impossible. All right. Well, moving on a little bit, it may be a bit foolish to do too much forecasting when it comes to this subject, but I do have a few questions that probably fall under that category that I'm about to ask you. But do you think biomedicine will be better funded after the coronavirus passes? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish it would be, but I don't think so. I think that once the crisis is over, that the very, very short memories of the people who hold the purse strings for that sort of research are going to revert to things that they think are going to be profitable in the short term, and that will be the end of that. It's a depressing thought, but I, I, I fear that things will revert very, very quickly. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. And I'm, I hope that we all retain a very good memory of how bizarre and frightening and disconcerting and disorienting this whole situation is and that people have a longer view of things across the time dimension and talk about what's really important and what mm -hmm. what's going to be better for everyone as time goes on. But I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. Well, not to be too depressing here with this next question, but people didn't react to the coronavirus crisis until the last minute. How bad is it going to have to get before people start taking climate change seriously? And are we learning anything important from this moment that could inform our response to it? Well, it's funny that you say that. I feel like those two are actually kind of happening at the same time right now. Right. A number of interesting, unprecedented things have come to my attention in the last couple of days. Los Angeles, California has the best air quality it has had since the mid 60s. And all it took was for people to be slightly less self-centered and selfish and driving around all the goddamn time. And the air cleared up so quickly. Mm -hmm. The canals of Venice are clear. I mean, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know when, I imagine it's about the same time. It was probably the early 60s when that last was. But if you look online, for, you can actually see the bottom in the canals. That is unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, if, if you've ever been to Venice or or just watch the opening chase scene in the remake of The Italian Job and you see that the, the water's entirely opaque, mm -hmm. like it's not like, oh, it's kind of cloudy, like it it it's opaque. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> you can see in that water. And the fact that it only took a couple of weeks of people just chilling out a little bit, you know, and again, this is the interesting thing, right? People talk about this sort of idea of lockdown, but we're not really on lockdown. It's just everybody has tried to minimize their impact as much as possible. 
And again, that impact was not the the goal. That was the side effect. People are trying to minimize their sort of uh, exposure, and that has minimized their carbon footprint and their immediate pollution imprint and footprint. And looking at how drastically things can change in such a short period of time, if we all just got it together to do it, I have just the slightest shred of hope that this can cast enough light on things so that people can say, hey, you know, if I were slightly less selfish and thinking about the fact that in a long term, larger scale selfishness, that understanding that what's best for me is really looking out for what's best for everybody, that maybe we could dig our way out of this mess if we were just vigilant about it. And maybe that'll catch on. So I have just a little bit of hope that, you know, maybe maybe there's a way out of this. And Mm -hmm. maybe because we're seeing such unexpected results so quickly that it might have a chance to stick. So here's another crowdsource question. Does this experience teach us any new ways of responding to the drug war and mass incarceration or rampant nationalism and the separation of families by ICE and the historic exploitative, oppressive relationship between capitalists and laborers? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think that one of the things that a lot of people have been pointing out that I think is really important to note is that all of these things that are seen as sort of extreme measures can be taken without all of the effects that everybody's afraid of happening, which is why they're never taken. You know, so people saying, oh, we can't just let people out of prisons. Oh, oh, all, sort, all sorts of horrible things will happen. Well, I actually can. Um, oh, we, we can't we can't just stop having people you know, go and run the banks and we, we can't just stop having rent. We can't just stop it. Actually, actually all of these things are quite possible. And it, it's, it's really strange to like see all of these things happening. And, and it's not, it's no longer sort of a theoretical fencing match that's being fought out in the letter pages of academic journals. It's, Hey, guess what? We did it because we had to. And guess what? It didn't result in this horrible crisis that you keep claiming is the reason we can't do it. Right. You know, I thought it was put very well by somebody a while ago that says, Hey, you know, it's amazing to see these like announcements in America that continue to say things like due to coronavirus, we will be offering human rights. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. It's like to this point, we've been doing like sort of this evil cosplay thing. (laughs) And now that now that, <laughs> now that shit has hit the fan, it's like the fuck are we doing? Like let's just chill out. Right. And I think that that's that's at least opened up the possibility for some more dialogue on all of these things. So it seems just a little less crazy when those of us who are prison abolitionists say like, yeah, let's just close the prisons cuz they really don't do anything good. That the response isn't going to be quite as quick when people are saying, oh, yeah, but what about that can be like, yeah, you know what? We kind of did like a a first step of that Mm -hmm. and it really was totally okay, and more than okay, it was incredibly productive and helped a lot of things. And so, you know, as much of a tragedy as it is for everybody getting sick and everybody dying from coronavirus, the viruses become very instructive in a lot of a lot of contexts. As this thing gets worse, we see folks continue to get laid off, while at the same time the federal government is giving these huge subsidies to capital. What do you think this crisis means for the future of labor? I don't know, and I'm not enough of a scholar on the subject to really be able to prognosticate well. I hope for good things, but that that particular arena is, it's dark to my eye. The closest thing that I can say is that I tend to feel that when things shift drastically, when there are these great moments of upset, that what it does is it offers a possibility for the dust settling into a new structure that's also stable and for giving us a little more perspective that there are other stable states besides the one that we've been stuck in. And that maybe something else will arise. But I just don't know. Um, 
I'd be curious to hear what some of the other people that you tend to have on and have had on would say about this. And, you know, I'm hopeful and guardedly optimistic because of so many of the other things that we've discussed seeming to have this capacity for showing us that other structures are possible. Ones within the realm of labor have to be as well. And and, and hopefully there are things that can make things both more free and more equal, which again is the sort of central conundrum of anarchism, wanting to have freedom and equality. Because if we have freedom without equality, it's the jungle. And if we have equality without freedom, it's prison. And we don't want either of those. Do you think we'll see more people starting to do rent strikes? And do you think that's a good tactic that folks should engage in at this moment? Yeah. And and seeing the rent strike that's happening right now, or the rent strikes, I should say, that are happening right now, and the, the traction that those are getting, looking at general strike as a possible thing that might happen next because people feel sufficiently empowered and people feel sufficiently needful in acting rather than trying to stay small that yeah i mean it might it might open the door for some of those kind of old school actions that people don't call for as much anymore and maybe maybe it's time to dust off those old tools and see if they might be effective again i'd certainly like to see it i'll, I'll tell you that yeah some reactionaries might be thinking that they're scoring some points with this situation what i mean is It may seem to them that their isolationist fetishism is being proven correct and that this moment is a pragmatic win for nationalism. Is that true? If not, why not? Well, I think that's a time scale sort of issue, right? I think that a lot of the people that you see who try to push that kind of rhetoric I mean, it's flawed rhetoric, of course. And then on top of that, none of the solutions that they offer are actually solutions to the problems that are showing up. But the fetishization of prepping and isolationism and individualization, I think, is being sort of falsely praised in a lot of things. You know, I I think the examples of, you know, people hoarding things and stocking up on ammunition and And these sorts of things are, again, being fetishized because these are seen as things that people need to watch out for when in reality, that's the last thing you really need to be thinking about right now in terms of keeping, even in the most selfish of contexts, in terms of keeping yourself safe. Like, cool, your your ammunition store, is that's not going to feed you or clean your water or keep your septic tank from being clogged. Sorry. And yeah, I think it's it's increasingly easy for people to look at a problem like this where the scale is so large, both over a space dimension and over a time dimension, and make a fallacious conclusion of saying, look, I'm doing fine and I stockpiled all of these, all this toilet paper and all this ammunition. So clearly that's what made it fine. And it's like, it takes a second order level of logic and rhetoric to say, okay, you did fine, but let's look at why that is. Did you use any of that ammunition? No. Then how did that keep you safe? How much of that toilet paper that you managed to hoard actually got used? Oh, just the regular amount? Interesting. So maybe the reason that you ended up safe through all of this is due to something else. What do you think? And again, I don't think that people lack the capacity for the critical thought necessary to unpack these sorts of problems. It's just that oftentimes they fall into a set of patterns, a set of habits of trying to not engage those because of other factors. So I think, you know, yes, it's possible for people to use any outcome to try to support a view, however flawed, but I think that it doesn't take a lot of thought to pick that one apart. And again, hopefully this, in addition to all the other things, will continue to chip away at the culture of anti-intellectualism that we're seeing. And if things go well, then, you know, eventually it'll be sexy in the 
general population to be a critical thinker and to sit and try and unpack problems in a more productive way. And, you know, in, in my dream of dreams, everybody will start to realize that the virus being a really great example of not caring what your politics are, not caring what race you are and not caring where you live or where you're from or what you do for hobbies or what language you speak and realizing that it falls on all of us the same. And despite the fact that people may yell and scream when they're in the ICU saying, it's impossible for me to be sick. I only, I only commune with upstanding citizens and I vote the way you should. And saying, it really doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> yeah. Viruses don't care about that for sure. Viruses do not care about that. And, and as hilarious as that sounds like I, that is an actual quote oh my God. that I got from a friend of mine who's an ICU nurse oh, no. who said, you won't believe the shit that I heard last night. This woman was screaming. It's impossible that I could be sick. Oh no! I only commune with upstanding citizens. <laughs> I'm a Republican. <laughs> like <laughs> verbatim quote. <laughs> oh, my God. It's just, yeah, total removal from reality. I saw a screenshot from a tenant to a landlord that was like, hey, we all got laid off. Like, we want to pay rent, but it's probably going to be late. And the landlord was like, oof, sorry to hear that, hon. But I hope you're not one of those that live paycheck to paycheck because I'm going to need that rent soon. Good God. <laughs> like, Paycheck to paycheck, like the, the majority of people, yeah. you know, you, you are so <clears throat> fucking far removed from my world that you seem like an alien to me and vice versa, I'm sure to them. Yeah. And, you know, not to cut them any slack, but to view it a little more charitably, it's not it's not something that I think is ill intentioned. Like you say, it's just totally disconnected, not understanding that the contexts of most people are the context that you share. And honestly, I feel like that is at the root of almost every human conflict on every scale, just not taking the time mm -hmm. or the energy and undertaking that difficult step of realizing that there are people who think along lines that are not the same that you think. The things that they assume are different, the logical structures that they build are different, and so the conclusions they come to are different. And so if we skip that step, we all end up not having a conversation. Even though there's this alleged dialogue, it's not really a dialogue because all that's happening is there, there are two disconnected conversations that are happening where one person's saying, yes, but this, 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 and the other person says, yes, but this, 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 and, and they don't mesh, right? There's no progress because people are assuming things that are not the same, and people are using systems of logic that are not the same, and of course, their conclusions are not going to be the same. And so even when we approach people and say, look, you don't get it, taking the time and the energy to try to unpack things so that people can see things from a different perspective and trying to be as, as generous as possible to try to help people see things in other ways and also trying to be as patient as possible with their perspective and trying to understand that the bad outcomes that might look ill-intentioned just come from a different chain of logic and trying to understand that. I think that's really a good road to trying to develop bridges and build compassion and, you know, build better outcomes for everybody. Yeah, definitely. In the town that I live in currently, beans and bullets are becoming increasingly difficult to acquire. It's hard to figure out how to handle this situation when people are acting irrationally. And a bigger fear is that these sorts of uh, situations could lead to civil unrest. Do you think that this virus and the way people are reacting to it could promote something like civil war? And what do you think anarchists should be doing to seize the moment? Oh, it's not impossible. You know, we're dealing with uh, a high degree of volatility and a lot of variables. And what you're talking about is sort of a prisoner's dilemma sort of thing, right? Where, you know, you, you go to the drugstore and all of a sudden 
oh, they have, you know, four boxes of alcohol wipes. And the first instinct is, ah, I'm just, ah, great, I'm going to buy them all. And then hopefully (laughs) uh, sanity prevails and you have a moment of clarity and say, no, no, no. I'm going to get one uh, so that I can keep myself safe. And I'm going to very intentionally not get the other three because if other people can stay safe, then the group is safe. And by extension, I am more safe. However, at the same time, there are many people who will take a further step and say, yes, but if I don't buy these, then somebody else will who doesn't think to this second order of logic will come in and hoard them and will still be in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And then you have to like layer it again and say, okay, yes, maybe. But if you don't allow for that possibility, then it can't occur. And so it's still best not for you to hoard things, which again, the circle is back to this idea of trying to, you know, promote thoughtfulness and which will eventually give rise to more of a feeling of, of mutual aid. And the question of civil unrest, the question of resources becoming scarce and people perhaps turning to violent means to control them. I think there's a fork in the road here. And and it's hard to talk about the United States because the social structures there are so bizarre and hard to understand really what motivates people or what actions they'll take based on lack of logic or logic or, you know, combinations of the two. But again, if we just think about it rather abstractly, we imagine for a moment that resources have been hoarded up and things are no longer available, then we don't just have one possible outcome. We have two possible outcomes. The one possible outcome that is where most people's thoughts go, easy to think about because fear pervades, is, okay, then the people who don't have things are going to try to get the things from the people who do have them, and they're going to resort to base means of violence. And that picture looks very, very scary very, very quickly. And we start going back and rereading Cormac McCarthy and any number of other scary post-apocalyptic works. And However, the thing that is not as dramatic, but seems more and more likely given the results that we've been seeing is that, okay, now let's say for a moment that everything's been purchased and the pipelines are broken and okay, cool. There's, there's no more, there are no more dried beans available on the shelves in your town. A bunch of people have them though. Maybe instead of the people who don't having them turning to violent means, the people who don't have them mentioning that these things are not available. And then the people who do have them saying, well, gosh, you know, we have like a hundred times what we'll ever need. Uh, How about we share And now we don't have to deal with the infrastructure anymore. And you end up with this sort of autonomous zone by default where people are acting to help each other. And when everybody goes around and sort of tallies it up and says, you know what? We have enough food to feed everybody. How about we just get together and do it? And maybe this will be way easier. And guess what? We have enough of everything. And huh, geez, maybe we didn't need our local government after all if we just take care of each other. And maybe we didn't need a lot of things. And looking at how much mutual aid is happening against all odds and against so much of culture, especially in the United States, it's really, really hopeful. And it doesn't seem as far-fetched to me as it once did, given the things that are occurring. So yeah, civil unrest, civil war, it's it's not impossible, but I'm thinking more and more that it's a less likely scenario than I had feared. That looking at small systems of interdependent, independent mutual aid bubbling up are going to be more and more common. And and hopefully some of those structures will continue to stick after the dust is settled and that people will be less reliant on infrastructure and less reliant on government and will also have the capacity to, to think about solutions like that when they come up against things that are being barricaded by infrastructure and by government. A friend of mine made this wonderful graphic that I just posted on Twitter, I think yesterday, about mutual aid and fighting the virus. And I think it's really instructive. It just says mutual aid, antiviral action. And I think that, I think we all just need to help each other, help everybody, not just, not just other anarchists, but help other humans in any way you can, whenever you can. 
And I think that that is really the most powerful tool that anarchism has is the ability to show how powerful the system can be to see somebody in need where you have the capacity to help and help. And when somebody says, why did you do that? You say, because you needed help and I could help. And that's the end. And to be able to plant that seed in somebody's mind to realize that it really can be that simple and seeing it happen more and more, people will then become better versions of themselves. And, and it's that it's not that that far fetched an idea and that we all can be better. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Let's go ahead and move on to some listener questions. These aren't going to be in any particular order, but I think I have four questions here. I'll start with the first one, and uh, then we can move to the end of the conversation. While many of our collective responses to the current pandemic, such as social distancing, self-quarantining, hand-washing, not touching our face, etc., are well advised by authorities, These strategies have been largely voluntarily adopted by individuals. Does our collective response to the current pandemic reveal anything valuable about the capacity for mass groups of humans to coordinate for common goals? Hell yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, I think that there's this interesting conflation that happens where we're like, oh, hey, people can do great things when they come together. And then there's this moment of like, uh, right, but weren't there all these authority figures that told us to? And so there, there are two separate things that are happening there, right? One is a bunch of people just, as you say, voluntarily adopting good practices to say, well, let's keep each other safe. And the flip side of saying like, yeah, but who's to say any of these things are real? Like, are viruses even real? Oh my God. Like, but no, let's just take a moment and say, if we separate those two and say, look, if people know that there are practices that they can undertake to keep themselves and other people safe and they understand that, then yeah, we have the capacity to do that. What would be better, of course, again, is if those initiatives came from within. If we were teaching each other more, if we were learning more conceptually about what sorts of things and why those sorts of things can keep us safe and what to do so that they're more adaptive to say, oh, gosh, I couldn't find ethanol, but understanding sort of, okay, well, it's it's, it's alcohol. So, yes, if I have something that's over 140 proof, I can just pour that on my hands and it's fine. Or if I have racing fuel and that's fine too. Understanding what that means and where it comes from maybe doesn't come from a source of authority, but comes from a place of understanding uh, that, that that's better. And so, yeah, I think it, it, it is very illustrative that we do have the capacity to come together and keep each other safe. And at the same time, I think that the things that can spark that don't have to come from places of authority and that we can help each other learn things. And I think that's happening more and more. Uh, I'm certainly learning a lot throughout this pandemic from a lot of people who are sharing stuff with me and, and uh, I mean, I'm grateful. So, so yeah. Yeah. In an anarcho-transhumanist journal, you wrote about squatting in space. I did. When are we going to make that happen? Oh, <laughs> well, Okay. So uh, that was a while back and and a lot has happened in the interim there. In that article, I suggested that somebody should go in and try to hack all the first gen Iridium satellites and make them into a free communication network. After writing that, I kind of tried to to do a version of that. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I didn't hack them, but I I was talking with a very talented hardware hacker and we were talking about the fact that the internet is basically broken, that we basically need to build a new one. Yeah. And I threw out this idea of trying to hack the Iridium satellite to develop a free network. And he said, don't hack them, just have them give them to you. And I was like, how would I buy them? He's like, don't buy them, have them give them to you. And I said, how on earth would that happen? And he says, do you have any idea what those things cost? And I was like, oh, yeah, so-and-so, billions, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, and that's their fiscal responsibility that they have to deorbit them. Do you know how much that costs? And also, if they donate them to you, do you know what kind of a tax write-off that is for them? 
and suddenly my brain started spinning and I was like, huh, <laughs> yeah. well, okay. So I wasn't living in Singapore at the time. I was living in Silicon Valley and I went back and I had a number of friends who were rocket scientists working or contracting with NASA. And I went over to this big communal house where they throw these big parties and I started to try and recruit people. And I was like, look, if I could get all the Iridium satellites, could you help me keep them up? And everybody's looking at me like, you're out of your mind. And I said, this is just an if. Can, can, could we set this up? And eventually I got enough people to be like, yeah, okay, yes, here's what you need, this, 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 this. And then I managed to make inroads at Iridium. And we ended up actually speaking with the CEO who ultimately told us no. But it was a very thoughtful conversation that we had. And he gave us four uh, really good reasons why not, if I can even remember them. Um, the first one was, he was like, look, I know you're thinking of trying to stretch this hardware to make it work a little longer, but this has already been working for way longer than it was designed to. If we thought we could stretch it any further, we'd do it ourselves. And I was like, okay, fair enough. He's like, secondly, despite the fact that you would take on all legal liability, the fact that our name is associated with these satellites, if something did go wrong on your watch, it would still reflect poorly on us in the public limelight. And I was like, okay, that makes sense as well. And there was a fourth one, I can't remember, but the third one was, he said, and ultimately, we've been devaluing these assets on our books, so the tax write-off isn't really that great of an incentive anyway. So one thing and another, that particular plan didn't work out. That said, <laughs> there is still a need to build a new internet. It might or might not manifest in trying to use space as a platform. There are a, a number of anarchists who are working to try to build space-based platforms. One thing that's been thrown around and discussed is the idea of building certain satellites for certain channels. Um, there was discussion of trying to loft something that would go in orbit along the west coast of the America. So it would run sort of from the tip of Baja, California, up through northern British Columbia and be something that would circle and there'd be a delay on it, but it would be able to transfer messages uh, on a secure and safe platform. This is a very complicated problem. There's a lot of infrastructural stuff to deal with and how do you deal with people making sure they have downlink infrastructure? How do you deal with the last mile problem for people who are in areas that are rural if it takes a centralized place for the uplink downlink to work? A lot of these interesting ideas are still being thrown around and there are some really smart people working on it. However, at the same time, the concept of trying to build a new internet uh, using mesh networks continues to be very appealing. And in terms of work with which I'm directly involved, the Pegleg project was the start of that, if you're familiar. Should I give a little summary on that one? Yes, please, if you don't mind. So quite some time ago, the Pirate Box platform, which is a wireless local area network that's not connected to the internet as such, uh, was developed by these two German fellows. And it's really a great platform. And you can build them out of wireless routers or Raspberry Pis or any number of other things. And they do have the capability to mesh. And so theoretically, if you build a bunch of Pirate Boxes and you have them sort of proximal, then you have this really powerful, very safe set of networks. And the Pegleg project was the idea of making a cybernetic version of this and building meshing nodes with high storage capacity that are implantable in the human body. And so now I have a, a half terabyte wireless server that resides in my thigh. And there are I guess, between eight and a dozen other people who have them currently. And of course, the same platform, you can do without embedding it in your body. And we are also working on a third generation of these that's going to be a higher powered, hopefully greater capacity and much, much smaller. So in terms of looking for alternatives to the internet, we're working on them. And the Pegleg Project being one arm of that one front of that fight, as it were. Um, I, 
is is promising to me. The idea of building mesh networks that can operate outside of the current infrastructure and replacing it, I think, is is very promising. Mm-hmm. So, I'm hopeful in that regard. Sure. Can biohacking exist without a large global capitalist network to supply cheap materials for any would-be biohacker? Yes, absolutely. If you're even questioning this, just go look at Left Anonym. Left Anonym is the hierophant of the biohacking world and has shown the world that you don't need money and you don't need support and you don't need infrastructure Left is such a badass and managed to pioneer just about every practice out there in terms of biohacking capability. And and I don't know the history exactly, but some of the first magnets ever done were done by Left, some of the first chip implants, all these things. And it was done with nothing. It was done with super glue, hot glue guns, and you know, and a stiff knife, a stiff drink, and a stiff upper lip, and, and that's all it took. I mean, left is a, a real, real monster in this regard. It's so wonderfully inspiring, all the things that left has done. In fact, the whole peg leg project only happened because it was left's idea. We were hanging out, and I showed left a pirate box that I had, and left said, that's pretty small. Could we implant it? And I was like... <laughs> I don't know. We could try. And literally a 50 hour sprint of hardware hacking later and then coding it, it got implanted and and left carried it for months. Uh, It was amazing. Um, And that's what led to the second generation, the second generation that I now carry. And that's what then led to the third generation that we're developing now. So, so yes, if you're out there and you are a biohacker or an aspiring biohacker, which means you're a biohacker and you don't have, or don't want to engage in the global capitalist network, you don't have to, you can operate independently at whatever level you want. You can engage the system some, a lot or not at all. And there are always There are always ways to do that. That, I think, is an important thing to remember when looking at infrastructure at any level. You think about going to the store to buy a loaf of bread. Well, you can do that. Cool. You could bake bread yourself. All right, cool. You could buy the ingredients. Now, you could also cultivate the ingredients. And so the empowerment of being more involved in the development of the things that you have and the things that you use can scale in both depth and breadth. You can bake bread every day. You can bake bread once a year. You can bake bread and be totally vertically integrated where you develop every single ingredient yourself from scratch. You can just buy ingredients and make your own bread. This is totally true also with biohacking. And it's very easy to get to get caught up and to get lost in the sort of mythology of the supply chain. I know I'm certainly guilty of it. It's like, oh, no, no, if I couldn't go buy this part, what would I do? It's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. That part, yes, it's made in a factory by machines. Okay, cool, yeah, but like a human being built that machine and a human being runs that machine and they're not much different from you. And some of these things are a little harder to control. And yes, of course, there are trade-offs associated with things scaling. But yeah, you're never entirely dependent, ever. You, if you really are absolutely hell-bent on being totally independent of the system, it does not stop you. If you, you want to do stuff and you don't want to have to deal with with the infrastructure, you don't have to. You, you really don't. And if you feel that like emotional pressure as though you do, take a moment and step back and inspect things really carefully because that fear that's been implanted in all of us, and again, like I'm not immune to this. It's a really easy thing to fall into, to be like, oh man, DigiKey doesn't have my part or oh gosh, this medical supplier won't sell me this thing because I don't have licenses. It's like very easy to sort of despair and and say, oh, I'm stuck. You're never stuck. You're never stuck. It might get harder and there might be more steps, but you're never stuck. You have to remember that everything ever produced in terms of infrastructure was done by some other humans, some other place. It's important to put these things in in some context. Uh, the things that we think sort of fall from the sky or are built in like these, you know, 
factories filled with nothing but robots. It doesn't, no, these are factories filled with people. And, and yeah, sometimes there are some robots there, but it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you are dependent on that pipeline. Yeah. So wh- whoever wrote that, I would, uh, you know, I very much encourage them to, to yeah, you, you want to get into biohacking and you don't want to have to deal with people who are selling aftermarket stuff for, for biohacking and want to build it yourself. Like, yeah, do it. Learn as much as you can. Make sure that you're doing it as best you can. But yeah, don't let anything stand in your way. That's how it started. And that's how everything started. Remember, every industry, every undertaking – Everything was DIY first. Every single thing was done by one person alone somewhere where everybody was telling them they were nuts. And guess what? They pulled it off. And all these years later, now when things are normalized, we're like, what? What? How would you do that without ordering it? Like, no, no. no. Somebody sat down and said, I'm going to try something very ill advised and see what happens. Yeah. Totally. Totally. All right, so this is the last listener question, and then we will move to the end of the conversation. After we get to a point where social isolation is no longer necessary and we don't have to repress physical contact with others, will we see an outpouring of sex and intimacy? And are we potentially looking at a second baby boom in 2021? Part one of that question, I sure hope so. And part two of that question, I sure hope not. Just to clarify, I I hope that there aren't a bunch of unwanted pregnancies that can't be dealt with. Yeah, of course, of course. But yeah, I think a lot of people will get some perspective being starved for touch and think about what that means. And I've seen a lot of people writing about sort of the development, the redevelopment of of courtship uh, at a distance, you know, the love letters becoming a thing again or becoming more popular again, you know, using the postal mail, romance being a little more involved, slightly longer timeline and, you know, things not quite as as shallow as, you know, Tinder and Grindr. But yeah, I I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I, I definitely think that once that we are off the long tail end of the curve. There'll probably be a lot of people organizing sex parties and they'll probably be pretty wild. Um, yeah, I think that'll that'll be good. I think the touchy point is when do we decide that that long tail has been reached so that when you do throw a big sweaty sex party, you aren't creating a second bump in the curve. And like th- that, that I think is the is the important thing to think about. That I think for people who do organize sex parties, it'll be a really relevant question. The people that I know who do organize sex parties, they all have pretty strict rules about barriers. So, in terms of there being a second baby boom, I, I think that's going to happen on a more personal level and not as a result of sex parties. And I don't know. Again, I wonder post pandemic whether the general vibe is going to be one of hope or is going to be one of sort of relief tinged with despair. And I think that'll sort of be the deciding factor. And I think that it really ties into a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here today. When things peter out, there is this feeling of cooperation and mutual aid and the environment making a turnaround and the sort of hope for the future being something possible, then yeah, then I can see a baby boom happening. And if instead what happens is there's this snap back to everybody being shitty and selfish and everything's gross again, then I think it's going to be much more despair based. And instead we'll see a lot of people getting sterilized um, and having more sort of end of the world type approaches to things rather than um, trying to trying to breed more. Moving to the end of this conversation now, what are some of the best ways that people can brave social isolation? Mm, Find other ways to connect. I think that having communications infrastructure is such a blessing. You don't have to wait days and days for a letter to come back. Video chat, text message, everybody you know, try and do things that are collaborative. There are great platforms out there where you can 
video chat and watch a movie where the movie is streaming to everybody separately at the same time. So you can still get together and watch a movie and interact about it. And if you're sort of stuck in terms of social isolation, if you're sitting there feeling like you're sitting on your hands, this is a great moment for you to dig into the things that are meaningful to you that you feel like you didn't have time for. And of course, like, you know, maybe it's just carpentry, but like if you feel like you wanted to get involved in some human rights issue or some some social justice issue or something where things were going to change. Like there's a lot of things that are pivoting. Like this is a great moment to grab onto it. And if you want to come join forces with us, we can always use more help. If you feel like you want to be part of four thieves and just haven't had the time or the bandwidth and you do now like get in touch, uh, contact us through the website and maybe get involved. Um, a number of people have already done that and it's really great because we're, we're getting a lot of help that we didn't have previously. And if we're not doing the sort of thing that you want to get involved in doing, think about what organizations you do really like that are doing good work that could maybe use your help as a volunteer and get in touch and tell them that you have the time and try to help any way you can. Groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, if you're big on sort of open communication and taking care of things like censorship and surveillance. They do a lot of good work. If you're looking into biotech type places, you want to do stuff related to that. There are groups like the Open Insulin Project and BioCurious and, and other groups that are trying to do things. There are a number of Jogal projects that are happening out there um, trying to develop open source tools to handle things specifically related to the pandemic, like open source ventilators, because those are going to run out really soon. Other tools like that. One thing that people came to us, apparently there's a huge shortage of asthma inhalers. A while ago, we figured out a way that you can hack vape pens to make inhalers. Uh, you can also just, if instead of using albuterol, you're using epinephrine, you can just inject it with our old friend, the EpiPencil. Look for, yeah, look for whatever the things that you care about that are important. And there are or always organizations that are trying to work on them, at least almost always. And if not, it's time to start one. And I, I think that's very instructive. If you are somebody who's saying, hey, why has nobody started an organization trying to deal with this problem? Well, it's time for you to do it. Because clearly, if you don't do it, nobody will. That is a very difficult step to take. I know. And if you're one of those people out there who's trying to start something and you're, you're having a hard time, just get in touch. My direct messages are open on Twitter right now. And if, if you're looking for a little moral support, feel free to write and, um, and we can shoot the shit because there's a lot of things that need to be done out there. And this is your moment. Grab it now or forever wish you had. All right, Dr. Michael Lawfer. Thanks so much for joining me today. Everyone needs to go follow Michael and the work that Fort Thieves Vinegar Collective is doing. I can't thank you enough for joining me today and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for having me and keep bringing the good word to the people. You got it, stay safe out there. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my interview with Dr. Michael Lawford. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see this project continue going, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. And if you like the work that Michael and his crew do, consider helping them out as well. And if you aren't able to contribute financially, help us reach a larger audience by liking and sharing this episode. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to check out our full catalog at nonservium.media. Remember to stay safe out there. We'll get through this mess eventually. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>